Hi, my name's Craig. I'm the Technical Manager here at QNAP UK. Uh, today I wanted to talk about our QSW-M series switches. So the M standing for Managed. Uh, we've got six switches in this category. We've got the three on screen here, which are the uh, rack mountable versions. They do also come with rubber feet though, so you can uh, stand them on a desk if you want to as well. Uh, get some nice separation from the tabletop so it doesn't scratch it. And we've also got uh, the white chassis versions. These are desktop mount only, so there's no rack mount option for these. There's no uh, brackets included in the box. There's, there's no way to attach any. Um, so the main difference here is the white ones here are going to have um, 10 gig and 1 gig ports. Um, the majority of which will be the 1 gig, but there are a few different options there. Um, up to four 10 gig ports on these options here. Um, with the black ones, every single port is going to be capable of 10 gig. Um, uh, the SFP Plus ports can do 10 gig and 1 gig. The RJ45 ports uh, are multi gig uh, solutions, so you can do 10 gig, 5 gig, 2.5 gig, 1 gig, um, and lower as well with the, uh, with the RJ45 ports there. Uh, today I'm going to uh, walk you through a demo and uh, the interface of a QSW M12088C, the largest one that we do. So if I come over here to my other web browser, so here is the QSW M1208. So the, the first screen we're seeing here is the overview. Um, so here we've got the port status of all the different connections. So I'm pretty much maxing out the RJ45 ports here. Um, so we can see here we've got uh, basic information, model name, IP address. And the reason it needs an IP address is uh, to gain access to the management interface. Um, all managed switches would have an IP address so that you can actually uh, configure them. Some may do it through a web interface like this. Some may have a utility to do it or a dashboard. Um, we're using the, the web management option here. Uh, so here I've got um, just a little transfer happening in the background here, so a 10 gig transfer just so that we can see some bandwidth here popping up on the graph. Um, so here we're seeing which ports are active, so um, I've got a NAS on port 7, um, I've got a virtual machine running somewhere else on port 9. Um, so they're doing a 10 gig transfer between them, just a little benchmark tool so that we can see some traffic popping up there. So if we go into the first screen, probably the most important screen, uh, this is the port management section. So here you can see um, the whole status of the switch and you've got different subheadings within here as well. Um, so the port management screen, you've got a few drop downs. So right now the port status is just telling you what's up, what's down, what's enabled. Um, if there are any ports disabled, I don't have any disabled, so nothing's flashing up there. But as you hover over each one, it lights up the different ports to let you know the status of each one. Uh, we can also check things like the link aggregation status. So I do have a link aggregation set up on ports uh, on two ports. So if we ho uh, hover over that, it shows you that's ports 9 and 10. Uh, they're bonded together into a, a link aggregation group there so that we're getting 20 gig a second through that, uh, that, single, uh, uh, that single device through its two um, 10 gig ports. As we scroll down this list here at the bottom, we can go through and see all the different options. So a few of them are linked down, so I've got nothing connected to them. Um, and as you hover over each one, you'll see the switch image at the top will change. So if I hover over port 7, we can see port 7 lit up on the drawing and so on. Um, so port 5 would be the uplink to my normal network, where my internet connection is and other, other devices. So that's only a 1 gig link. But everything else here is a 10 gig link. So as we go through, we can see all the different options. And we'll see ports 9 and 10 are missing. That's because they're in that link aggregation group. So if I scroll down even further, we can see that link aggregation group of number two, which has got the two ports in it. So it's showing here that I've got 20 gig a second full duplex. Um, so that's a very easy way to just get the status of your whole switch. And you've got different things like statistics, what ports are doing what, you can see the different types of bytes, or if there's been any errors being transmitted, hopefully you shouldn't see any there. Um, and then you've also got the options where you can actually configure the port in the port management setting. So if you wanted to set the manual speed of a port, you can. So there's a little drop down there that lets you go through and select different options that we've got. So if you wanted to choose 10 gig, 5 gig, 2.5 gig, 1 gig, you can set that here um, in the drop downs that we have. And you've also got options to enable flow control if you should need it. Um, and at the bottom, you can turn off or um, uh, turn on your different link aggregation groups if you've got them set as well. Um, talking about link aggregation, let's switch to that screen. So here we can check the status of it. You can see the, whether you've got VLANs assigned to them, uh, the link aggregation status of whether it's up or down. Um, but the main thing we want to look at here is creating a link aggregation group. Uh, for anybody that's not familiar with a link aggregation group, it, it may be called uh, port trunking. Um, some people might use the technical name. Uh, 
which is a uh, LACP. Um, so we've got different options within here. So if we click inside uh, to create a group on link aggregation group one, you get two choices, LACP or static. You can pick the ports. Um, so as I've already got ports nine and 10 in a link aggregation group, it will not let me select them again. So if I want to do it with ports seven and eight, I simply select them, click save, done. Link aggregation group is created just like that. Very easy, very simple. Uh, we'll go back to the item we missed here, which is VLANs. Um, so one of the major benefits of having a managed switch is that you can do VLANs on them. Um, it allows you to um, segregate uh, network devices uh, from each other uh, for different purposes. Um, one of the most popular purposes would perhaps be to segment VOIP phones away from the rest of the network traffic, um, and you can create different rules within that VLAN group for that. Um, another one may be that uh, in a server environment, you might want to turn on um, jumbo frames, much larger packets for faster transfers. Um, but if anybody else was to try and communicate in that network uh, without jumbo frames enabled, um, it can cause issues. It, it definitely wouldn't be efficient to do that. Um, so here to create uh, VLANs, we do uh, tagged and untagged options. So you can simply tick a couple of untagged, a couple of tagged, and you can pick in here the VLAN ID that you want to set. Um, so whatever VLAN ID that you set, um, just make sure it's the same across your different switches, your different devices that need to connect in. Um, the different link aggregation groups are set separately from everything else. So the link aggregation groups get their own uh, section for VLANs. So you can see here ports 9 and 10 that are in that group um, uh, grayed out. I cannot click on those. Um, they're in link aggregation too. So I would have to choose whether I want them tagged or untagged here. Uh, one of the next options we've got here is RSTP, which is Rapid Spanning, uh, Spanning Tree Protocol. Um, it can uh, perform a couple of functions, but probably the, one of the most used functions here is it prevents a loop in your network. Um, as the sort of icon there shows you, um, if you were to have um, three switches and run a network cable between all three, um, you would create a loop in the network and eventually traffic's going to snowball out of control and nothing's going to actually communicate when it's a genuine uh, communication across the network. Um, so the RSTP configuration here is going to detect when that's happening and it will effectively cut the link of one of them um, to stop the loop from happening, to stop the, uh, the traffic just building up and building up and saturating everything. Um, so we've got that built into the, uh, to the device as well. Uh, we've also got uh, LLDP, uh, which is uh, the link layer discovery protocol. Um, it's a vendor neutral link layer. Um, it's used by uh, different network devices so that they can um, advertise their identity on the network. Um, so if I was to click over to LLDP remote devices, um, we can see here port five, which is the port I have uplinking to my other switch, uh, which just happens to be a managed switch as well. Um, it's advertising all the information about itself um, that I've told it to. So the system name, uh, what its current capability is it's just a bridge to the network it's not tagging anything it's not changing the, the communication in any way um, and you can also go into the mac address table so in the mac address table here we can see all the devices that have been found uh, now because the this switch is uplink was on port 5 as we scroll through this list we're going to see a lot of things on port 5 um, simply because that's where the rest of my network is so as i start scrolling through the options uh, we can see what's connected to what port and get a little bit of information about them, such as what their MAC address is, their machine address code, uh, so that we can um, uh, set different things if we need to. You know, you could do DHCP by uh, uh, static DHCP via a DHCP re uh, a MAC address reservation if you wanted to as well. Um, so some extra options that we've got down here. We've got IGMP snooping. Um, so this is a, a great feature to enable. Um, it, it basically monitors broadcast traffic that's on the network. Um, so any broadcast traffic that's out there is exactly that. It's a broadcast. It, it goes out everywhere. Now, this can uh, flood a network quite quickly if you've got a lot of devices doing uh, broadcast packeting. Uh, for example, if you have trouble doing things like um, airplay mirroring with an iPhone or uh, casting to a Google Chrome, uh, a, a Google device uh, for next to your TV, the Chromecast, um, if there's anything that's doing the broadcast traffic doing that, the best thing about IGMP is it decides um, by looking at the packets, where they're coming from, where they're going to, and it doesn't saturate the whole network with that broadcast traffic. It focuses it to where it needs to go. Um, so that if you had a broadcast going from, say, 
uh, port one on the switch to port two, that's exactly where it will go. It won't flood everything. Um, and then you can have a separate one from three to four. Um, again, not adding, you're not snowballing uh, with all these different broadcasts. Um, if you were just using your network for a bit of home gaming, something like that, you probably wouldn't find any benefit to having IGMP enabled. It wouldn't improve anything. Um, but if you're in a, a quite a large network where there's a lot of broadcast traffic happening, um, that's what IGMP snooping is absolutely fantastic for. Uh, we've also got an access control list so that you can do different filters, packets, um, different conditions. So you can set those up if you need to as well. Um, so you would simply come down here and you can just add the different access control um, restriction that you need to and you can apply it to whichever port that you want um, within the setup. And we've also got quality of service. So you can set up different um, services to be priorities over um, uh, different other functions and you can choose which port has the most priority over anything else. Um, so we've got that function built right in as well. Uh, down here on the left, we've got some basic information about system settings. So it gives you the uptime of the switch. This is where you can change the IP address, password, time. And um, we sync with an NTP time server to make sure that everything um, that's recorded, say in the logs or anything like that, has got the correct time and date next to it. So you know when um, a specific thing was to happen. Um, and we've also got a backup and restore function. So if you've got a, a complex configuration on the switch and you want to apply it to another switch, um, you can download the config here and copy it over to that one as well. And at the bottom here, we do have a firmware update function. So you can do a live update where you just click check for update. And so long as your switch has access to the internet, it will do a live check. And we've also got a manual upload option there as well. Uh, one other thing, anybody familiar with um, accessing uh, QNAP NAS, we do have our QFinder Pro application. Um, and QFinder Pro will also find the switches. It's not just for NAS, it will find um, other QNAP devices such as our switches here as well. Um, so you can see that and you can have some basic configuration options here. If you were to go into the right click, you can configure the uh, device directly from this app, some of the basic functions, um, or you can just log straight into the web interface as well. So it's a really handy utility um, that you can download to help you uh, discover any other QNAP devices that you may have on the network. Okay, thanks a lot for watching.